Hey, what's up YouTube? Welcome back to my tuition. So in today's video, we're going to be continuing our advanced math topics. We're going to continue talking about stationary points in terms of being able to figure out whether a stationary point is a maximum, minimum, or saddle point. So when it comes to stationary points, you need to know what a stationary point is. So a stationary point is a point on a surface where things look relatively flat at that point. For example, a maximum point on a surface is a very common stationary point. The surface flattens out because everywhere else it's sloped upwards, but once you get to the top, the slope flattens out. On the other hand, you can have a function that's shaped like a valley. For these types of functions, the same thing. If you get down to the bottom, to the lowest point in that valley, at that point, things flattens out. And a point like this, where you're at the lowest point on the function will be called a minimal. But it doesn't just stop there because there are other stationary points. For example, an inflection point where a function is increasing and then all of a sudden it flattens out for a little bit and then it starts to increase again. So that point where it flattens out is called an inflection point. And then there's another classic stationary point which will be called a saddle point. It's a point where the function is shaped like a saddle around that point. So for a saddle point, in one direction you get upward curvature, but in the other direction you get downward curvature. It's a point where there's a maximum and a minimum at the same time. So that will be a saddle point. So when it comes to figuring out what's going on in a function near a certain point, the best thing you can do is to look at the Taylor series of that function around that point. And a Taylor series is very convenient to use because it's just a polynomial. The Taylor series allows you to predict, allows you to estimate the value of a function at any given point. So here we can estimate the value of the function f of xy at the point xy by, by setting it equal to the value of the function at a known point, x0, y0, and then evaluating how the function changes as we move from x0, y0 to xy. As we move from x0, y0 to xy, we have to take into account the derivative or the rate of change of the function. And of course, there are different orders of derivative. You can take the derivative as many times as you like, but when it comes to just analyzing a function near a certain point to figure out what type of curvature we have, we only need to go up to the second order derivatives. We're just going to look at the Taylor series up to the second order derivatives and then ignore all the higher terms because we're not going to move far away from the point x0, y0 for those terms to matter. So when you take a look at the Taylor series and you're looking for a stationary point, the first thing you want is for the first order derivatives to vanish because the first order derivatives are the main approximation as to what the slope of the function looks like at that point. And if you're at a stationary point, then the slope should look relatively flat. The derivative that tells you that your slope has flattened out will be your first order derivative. And a flat slope is a slope with a derivative equal to zero. So that's the first thing you want for your stationary points. You want the first order derivatives to be equal to zero. Point number one, okay? Now, once you have found all the points where your first order derivatives equal zero, then you have found all your stationary points. And once you have your stationary points, you've done half the work. Then all you have to do is figure out what type of stationary points you have. And to figure out what type of stationary points you have, you have to take into account now the second order derivatives. The second order derivative will tell you what type of curvature you have at that point. So when it comes to the second order term of the Taylor series, all you want to know is whether or not this term is positive definite, negative definite, or, or alternate. If this term is positive definite, that means that the surface rises. And if the surface rises, no matter which direction you move in, you are at a minimum. Likewise, if the curvature is negative definite, you are at a maximum point. Now, remember we talked about saddle point where in one direction, the curvature is upwards, but in the other direction, the curvature is downwards. So that's the case where this curvature is going to depend on the direction in which you move in. The f of xy and the f of yx are going to be equal. So we can just combine those and get two f of xy delta x delta y. Now remember, what we're trying to do is figure out whether or not this quantity is positive definite, negative definite, or alternate. The way we figure that out is to, is to move away from this point in all possible directions and see what happens to this quantity. Now the question is, how do we vary the directions in which we move away from this point? Well, every delta x and delta y is going to correspond to a certain direction along a certain line. Every direction is going to correspond to a certain line with a certain slope. So therefore, delta x and delta y are going to have a linear relationship with a certain slope. And therefore, we can write delta y equals m, which is the slope, times delta x. And as we vary the slope, we get to vary the directions. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug in m times delta x for delta y. And then in the end, we're going to vary m to see what happens to the quantity. 
and as we plug in m times delta x for delta y, we get the second order partial with respect to x times delta x squared plus the second order partial with respect to y times m squared delta x squared plus two times the mixed partial derivative times m times delta x squared. And now remember, when it comes to this quantity, we just wanna know what sign it takes. Is it always positive? Is it always negative? Does it fluctuate? Of course, in this quantity, delta x squared, that is a number squared. And whenever you square a number, you always get a positive number. So we can eliminate the delta x squared because it's a common factor for this quantity and it's going to be a known positive quantity. So we can eliminate this quantity. And when we eliminate the delta x squared, we get the second order partial with respect to y times m squared plus two times the mixed partial derivative times m plus the second order partial derivative with respect to x. And perfect, this is exactly what we wanted because now we have a very simple quantity that is just a polynomial of the slope m. So this is just a quadratic equation of m. And we know what a quadratic equation looks like. A quadratic equation is just a second order polynomial that has a u-shaped curve. If this polynomial is positive definite, it means that the entire function is going to be above the x-axis, above the horizontal axis. And if it's above the horizontal axis, it's positive definite and it's going to be a minimum. On the other hand, if this polynomial is negative definite, it's going to live below the horizontal axis and therefore it's going to correspond to a maximum. And lastly, if this polynomial has positive and negative value, that means that it's going to cross the horizontal axis at two points, which means that it's going to have real zeros or real roots. So if the polynomial crosses the horizontal axis at two different points, it means that it has two real roots, and if it has two real roots, it's a saddle point. So that's all we gotta know. All right, so let's go ahead and do an example problem. Okay, this problem says, identify and characterize all stationary points of the function f of x, y, which equals x squared times y minus two minus y squared. All right, so first thing, let's go ahead and find our stationary points. We find our stationary points by setting all of our first order derivatives equal to zero. So let's go ahead and solve for those and set them equal to zero. Our partial derivative with respect to x is 2x times y minus two. And then we find our partial derivative with respect to y, which equals x squared minus two y, and we set that equal to zero as well. So now let's look at our first function and see where it equals zero. Well, it's pretty easy to see, right? If the value of x is zero, then the entire thing equals zero. So now we want to get the corresponding value of y from our second equation. So we go to our second equation and we plug in zero in for x. And when we plug in zero in for x, we get two y equals zero, which means y also should be equal to zero. Therefore, we found our first point of zero, zero. All right, so let's go ahead and see if we can find more stationary points. Going back to our first equation, we also have a quantity that says y minus two. Now, if that quantity equals zero, then f sub x will also be equal to zero. And when would y minus two be equal to zero? Y minus two will be equal to zero when y equals two, right? Once again, we go over to f sub y, plug in y equals two and see what we get for x. When we plug in y equals two, we get x squared minus four equals zero, which means x equals plus or minus two. Okay, so this means that we found two more stationary points. One point is x equals minus two and y equals two. And the other point is x equals two and y equals two. So now we just need to go and figure out what type of stationary points we have. All right, let's go. Now remember when it comes to classifying our stationary points, we need to take a look at the second order derivatives. All right, so let's go ahead and rewrite the first order derivatives. And now let's go ahead and calculate the second order derivatives. So, okay, so we have all of our second order partial derivatives. So now we're ready to analyze our points. So let's start with point zero zero, which was our first stationary point. So we go to our second order partial derivatives and set x equal to zero and y equal to zero. And when we do that, what do we get? We get f sub x x equals minus four and we get f sub y y equals minus two and we get f sub x y equals zero. So now we just need to take a look at what type of polynomial we get from these partial derivatives to see what type of point we have. We get minus two m squared minus four. Is this a positive definite polynomial? Is it a negative definite? Does it alternate? If it alternates, that means it has two real roots. So we need to check to see if this polynomial has two real roots. We can factor out a minus two and we get minus two times m squared plus two. So we still have a quadratic equation in terms of m squared plus two. So we want to see, can we factor this polynomial in terms of its roots? Basically, we want to know what quantity of m would make this quantity be equal to zero. We want m squared to be equal to minus two. 
but that's not possible because whenever you take a real number and you square it, you can't get a negative number, you get a positive number. And therefore this polynomial does not have any real roots. Clearly this point is going to be a maximum point because this polynomial has a downward curvature. The n squared term is being multiplied by negative two. The entire polynomial is going to be underneath the horizontal axis and it's going to be, and it's going to be negative definite. And a negative definite polynomial is going to correspond to a maximum point. Okay, so the point zero zero is a maximum point. So let's go ahead and take a look at the other two points. Okay, so the next point is the point negative two, two. So we go ahead and solve for the second order derivatives. And once again, we go ahead and write down our polynomial, which will be equal to minus two m squared minus eight m. We can factor out a negative two m and we get negative two m times m plus four. So we've been able to factor this polynomial from its quadratic form. And clearly we see that the roots will be m equals zero and m equals negative four. And therefore this polynomial has two different real roots, which means that it crosses the horizontal axis at two different points, which means that it fluctuates from top to bottom. And therefore this is going to be a saddle point. Okay, easy. All right, let's go ahead and do the same thing for our last point, point two, two. Once again, we go ahead and write down our polynomial. We have minus two M squared plus eight M. And once again, we're able to factor this polynomial in terms of minus two M times M minus four. It has two real roots. One root is m equals zero, the other one is m equals four. All right, so once again, this polynomial is going to be a saddle point. So our three stationary points, we have a maximum and two saddle points. So that's the simplest way I can tell you guys how to distinguish between maximum, minimum, and saddle points. Hopefully that was intuitive for you guys. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave it in the comment section below. If you want us to cover more videos like this, and more topics like this, go ahead and leave a request. Go ahead and like. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button and become part of our academic family here where we are always focused on becoming the best version of ourselves. All right, so welcome to the family. Go ahead and like, share, and subscribe. And as always, I'll see you guys in the next one. All right, bye-bye.